Welcome back to our reinforcement learning hut. By the end of last week, you've probably learned one huge concept, which is that if you know the value function or action value function, that you can find optimal policy very easily. You have also found at least one way to infer this value or action value function by means of some weird kind of dynamic programming. This is all nice and well, but uh, now we're going to try to understand how this transfers to any practical problems and find out all the limitations that accompany it. What I mean by practical problems is basically any kind of problem that arises in the wild, where you don't have access to all the states, all the state action transition probabilities, and so on. In the worst case, as I've probably shown you already, you have all the access you want to the agent, you can implement anything there, but the environment is mostly a black box that responds to your actions in some kind of hardly modelable way. Think of environment as your Atari game, or maybe a robotic car, or, well, this automatic pancake flipper, for, for whatever matter. Even in the trivial kind of sterile case of Go, please don't blame me for calling it trivial, even in this case you don't know anything about how, for example, your opponent is going to react. You can model it to some degree, but you're never given accurate predictions of what's going to happen on your next turn. So the first problem that arises here, and actually a huge problem, that you no longer have access to the state transition probability distribution, or the reward function as well. You can sample states and rewards from your environment, but you don't know the exact probabilities of them occurring. So in this case, of course, you cannot simply compute the expectation of, say, action values with respect to possible outcomes, and this prevents you from both training and using your optimal policy given the value function. So what are you going to do to approach this problem? Is there any trick of the trade from machine learning that you do when you don't know a probability distribution? Well, yeah, you kind of learn it. This is what you do in machine learning when you have unknown dependency, unknown structure in the data, and you have a lot of samples to train a model. You can train another network that would, for example, take your breakout game and predict the probability of the next state. It would kind of sort of technically work, but the problem here is that it's usually much harder to learn how the, how the environment works than to find an optimal policy in it. In breakout, this transition function is actually an image-to-image -image problem, and we should have to use probably a fully convolutional network that would take an image and predict the next image, which is uh, super complicated comparing to simply picking an action. In a more kind of... Uh, leisure-rated problem. If you're trying to uh, find whether or not you want a cup of coffee, you don't you, you're not required to find out how the coffee machine works. Or you can, but that's a lot of spare work that you don't actually need. Instead, what you want to do is you want to design a new algorithm that would get rid of this probability distribution. So it would do by only using samples from the environment. So let's add a bit more formalism, a bit more details to this problem. With your usual value iteration, there are two missing links, the two spots that you cannot compute explicitly. First, you cannot compute the uh, maximum over all possible actions. To do so, you would have to actually see the rewards for all actions, and in model free setting, in the black box setting, this would take um, at least one attempt for each action. So to figure out whether your robot should uh, do action A or action B, should it, for example, jump forward or just uh, make a single step forward, you have to do both things and then see which one of them uh, yielded a better reward, plus the value function. This is kind of impossible, because in real life, if you're taking some particular action, there is no undoing. You cannot get back in time. Another problem is this expectation. Here you actually have to expect over all possible outcomes, all possible next states. And this is another problem that you cannot approach directly, because in real life you're only, only going to see one outcome, one possible result. See, if you're trying to use a slot machine, if you're pulling a lever, then you're only, only going to see one outcome, not all the sets of outcomes with their respective probabilities. Otherwise, you would be much better off in any gambling. Now, what happens here is you have, uh, basically, you have a lot of expectations and maximizations that you cannot take exactly. So let's find out what we actually can do to see how we can approximate them and approach this problem. The usual model free settings requires that you train from not all the states and actions, but the trajectories. And trajectory is basically a history of your agent playing a game. Either it is a history from state 0 to the last state, so you begin playing breakout, you take a few actions, you hit a few breaks and then you lose, or you win, or whatever, depending on your agent. Or it's maybe a partial session, so you begin but maybe didn't finish yet. So this trajectory is basically a set of uh, states, actions, and rewards coming in a sequence. So there's first states, first action, first reward, second state, second action, second reward, and so on. 
Of course, you can sample a lot of those trajectories, and for many algorithms, you need plenty of them. But in many cases, in many practical applications, most importantly, each trajectory is a particular expense on your side. So if you're training a robotic car, you would actually have to consider its uh, expenses in the gasoline, in maybe the amount of time you spend on it, to uh, take just one session of, say, driving five minutes to, through a street. Now, if you're talking about, say, Atari games, it's a little bit cheaper because you no longer need to spend money. You just need to spend, in fact, computer resources, which do convert in money. Now, those costs are different for each environment, but they are usually non-zero. So you have to take that into consideration. Now, the other issue is, again, we don't have to, we don't, we're not able to see all the possible outcomes. We only see one outcome and only try one action at a time. So to find all the possible uh, outcomes, you have to sample a lot of trajectories and average over the different actions, the different outcomes in them. That can be quite costly. So once we've got those trajectories, we have to somehow use them to train our algorithm. And the first question is a question for you, by the way, is that which kind of value function would you prefer to train? If you, if you only have trajectories, there's no probability distribution. It would be better if you had a perfect value function of a state or an action value function of state and action. Which is better? Well, right. As you probably remember, if not, you might have guessed it by using your common sense. The idea is that if you have state value function, then to find an optimal policy, you actually need to average with the probabilities that come from the environment. So you have to compute the expectation over all the possible next state of this value function. You don't get this thing unless you explicitly approximate it. On the contrary, if you already have perfect Q functions, action value functions, you just pick the action with highest action value, and you're golden. Here's your optimal policy. So the first decision here is that unless we're trying something very specific and exotic, we'd be better off learning a perfect Q function than a V function. And even an imperfect Q, if, well, sorry, Q function would do. Now, to keep it strict and formal, let's recapitulate on what action value is and how it is defined. The definition from the last lecture is that action value is the expected amount of your cumulative returns, the reward plus gamma times next reward plus and so on that you would get if you start from state s, then take action a, and both s and a are function parameters here, and then you end up on the next state after which you follow your policy. If this policy is an optimal policy, this gives you q star. And if it's your policy, it would be q pi, so far as the notation goes. So the cool part about q function is that if you know this q function, this by definition gives you access to an optimal policy, given it's deterministic. And the Q function itself is very easy to express in terms of V function. So this neat formula, if only with an expectation for stochasticity, gives you a way to estimate Q function. And if you uh, kind of unroll the V term here as an expectation of action values over the policy, you'd get a recurrent formula for Q function. This is all probably unknown information for you since you've gone through the last week.